All right, so today's topic, we're going to be talking about leading people not like you. So we have this broken into two different sections, and I think it's kind of important to have these designators because while there is challenges here, there's great benefits here as well. So we're going to talk about the benefits of leading others like you, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges of leading others that are not like you because those do exist and we have to acknowledge them, right? So let's dive into some benefits to start off on a good note, all right? The benefits of leading others not like you. There's this mindset or this thought process, and Jocko's talked about this quite a bit. JP's talked about this, and he can attest to this as he jumps in here. There's this thought process of you get like this group of SEALs together, or you get a group of firefighters together, or a group of cops or EMS personnel or frontline medical providers, whatever you may be a part of. And we get this like, hey, we're mindless robots. Everybody thinks the same. We all have the one mission, one team, one fight, which is true, but that we're all the same individuals and the same strengths and same weaknesses. And that's just simply not the case. We have our own thought processes. We have our own talents. We have our own abilities. And that's what makes our team strong. The major benefit is that you're going to have different talents and strengths, and you have to be able to capitalize on those team members' strengths and abilities. Because look, here's the, here's the deal. If I have a team full of 20 or 25 or 28 or 30 Dannys, there's going to be like one, maybe two things that we're really good at. And that's it. And there's going to be a whole slew of things that we're going to fail at because there's a lot of stuff I'm not very good at, right? And I have to rely on my team and I have to pull on those strengths and those weaknesses on all those different talents to be able to be successful at those things. And here's the really cool aspect to that. When you get into this group environment and you have these people that have these different experiences, they have different emotional attachments, they have different abilities to detach, they have different um, lengths of careers. This gives you this immense ability to decentralize. That's our ultimate goal, right? When we think about our ultimate goal is we get to this silent leader position, which is off in the future after we've built all this um, infrastructure underneath us and after we go through these things is to be that silent detached leader. We can't be that silent detached leader if we're not coming from a point of decentralized command. Look, having a team around you that has all these different abilities, that has all these strengths, that has all these talents, that's what gives you the ability to decentralize. Because you're going to have someone that's like, hey, maybe they're super great at administrative detail stuff. Well, I tell you right now, I'm not that guy. I am not the one you want running the admin stuff. So I need to locate that person and give them ownership based over that. Hey, I'm going to kind of give you ownership of over all this administrative stuff. Maybe you have someone that's great at logistical things. I'm also not that guy. So I need to give ownership as I can over the logistics to this person. And as you get to know these people and as you start to discover their strengths and their talents, you can start to view them for what they really truly are. And each member of your team, they're an arrow in your quiver. And as you come across these problems and as you come across these challenges that your team's going to face, they're, you're going to face them on a day-to-day -day basis. You're going to face them with challenges that are known and unknown. And that's one of the biggest things we fight against in our career fields is the unknown. That's the most stressful thing we deal with. But as you approach the unknown and you know your people and you know their strengths and you know their weaknesses, as soon as you approach this problem, you can pull that arrow out of the quiver and go, hey, I've got someone who's great at this. Hey, I know PJ has a fantastic ability to take command of a scene. I know PJ has a great ability to communicate and be a leader. So I'm going to give him a span of control over this fire team or whatever this mission set is. All right. So we have to view them as assets. Each one of your people, their experience levels and their abilities, they're an asset. And that's one of the best parts of leading people not like you. Now, secondarily to that, I think probably even more importantly, is that the diverse abilities, the diverse experiences, they give you different perspectives. And perspective's a heck of a thing. We talk about this a lot at Echelon Front. I only have one perspective. I only have my perspective. And to be able to make good decisions, yeah, I can get other perspectives. I can go through critical thinking processes, right? And that's what we should be doing as leaders, so we should be doing as followers, right? Before we decide to follow on and make decisions. But my perspective, a lot of the time is flawed. And a lot of the time, my perspective is honestly wrong because it's only based off my experience. 
So having this huge team around you with all these different abilities, these strengths, these experiences, that gives you more perspective. And every time you make a decision, every time you approach a situation, every time you're dealing with an issue, you should want to have as much perspective as possible. And I wrote this down when I was thinking about this and going over this outline, and this really hit and like burned into my brain. And it was experience leads to conclusions. Experience leads to conclusions. That's a very real thing. And I find myself, and this is a flaw in me that I got to work on. I find myself as I navigate through problems and I think back through my career, 17 plus years of doing what you guys did. And I start to work those things into my personal life or problems I'm coming across now. Experience leads to conclusions. And I find myself jumping to those conclusions too often and too fast. So having people around you that can kind of step in there and say, hey, uh, actually, boss, I have experienced this in a different way, shape or form. I've had a better experience or it didn't go that way for me. And then being able to listen to them and absorb that perspective. man, that's invaluable to have around you at all times. Now, the other thing is those experiences and those conclusions, they may lead to some scars they may lead to training scars they may lead to you know problems that your team has and definitely on the benefit side let me give you an example i remember working in the field and for those of you guys working in police fire and ems which is probably the majority of this crowd here you know that dealing with anything child related it's difficult i don't care how much experience you have i don't care how long you've been doing it, it never gets easy right? And if you're new in the game, just know that it's never going to get easy. That's always something that we deal with. But I also remember that before being a parent, I didn't really have the ability to deal with children in the manner outside of just a clinical way. I didn't, I didn't know how to relate to them. I don't know how to talk to them. I didn't know how to get down on their level because I didn't have little ones of my own, right? So sometimes those calls were hard for me to navigate. And then after I became a parent, it gave me a whole different perspective. So then I started having the ability when leadership would call upon me, they're like, hey, we've got this little kiddo. Danny's starting to get pretty decent at dealing with kiddos. He's a daddy now. He's got two of his own. And I would start to have this ability to deal with children calls. Not that they're easy, but I'm just saying dealing and navigating and speaking with the children or the parents. Now, on the flip side of that, you may have someone who has the exact opposite experience. Maybe now it's, hey, now I'm a parent and my leader knows that, hey, Danny has a kiddo. He has this great experience here, but this is a super difficult call. So-and-so does not have a kiddo and is not necessarily affected in this manner. I'm going to have them step in because they're going to have a more detached, less emotional perspective of this and not get sucked in. And that's the benefit of having those differences, different perspectives. And the second example I'll give you of that is my wife and I. JP can attest to this. He knows my wife very well, my whole family. My wife and I are polar opposites. Polar opposites. And to sum that up, I basically I could tell you she's a great person. I don't know what that says about me, right? But <laughs> polar opposites. Her strengths are not my strengths, and my strengths are not her strengths. But here's the thing. That's why our marriage, that's why our parenting abilities, and that's why everything that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, that's why we're successful, because we're not the same. I can tell you right now, I don't know if I should say this publicly, especially being recorded, if it was left to only me to raise my children, my two boys, we're going to have a problem, <laughs> right? Because I don't have that soft side a lot of the times that my children need. And my children are complete polar opposites. My oldest child, my seven-year-old Gunner, and I can see JP's probably going to giggle at this. He's kind of like, he's my soft, innocent kid, right? He's very loving and very caring. And he's he needs a certain parenting style. And sometimes my wife is the one that can provide that better than me. My four-year-old, Bennett, is a psychopath right? He is complete opposite. And some of you are laughing that I've met some of my kids, right? He's a little four-year-old fiery redhead that goes a little bit off the rails. And sometimes he needs my style of leadership where I have to come in and my, my wife doesn't have that style sometimes. 
and I we're, we're complete opposites and we have different points of view so we can manage those situations better at different times. That's the benefit of having that diverse perspective in those different unique abilities in a team. What do you, you got anything on benefits, JP, before we jump to challenges? <clears throat> no, it's just, it just, I want to reiterate that we have to be thankful for our team. Yes. You have to be thankful. And when you were telling yourself, man, I'm so thankful that I have my team. I'm so thankful of the perspectives that they bring to this. It changes the way you think about their input, their ideas, and what you're doing. I mean, some of you guys have heard me say this. My mindset going through Buds was, I get to do this. And if you have that type of a mindset towards, I get to work with my team. I have an awesome team. I'm thankful for my team. I'm thankful for their backgrounds, their perspectives, and everything that they bring to the table. If you're telling yourself those things, then you're going to value your team more than Oh, what do these guys know? This new guy. I've I've forgotten more than he'll ever know. Okay, cool. Good. Awesome old timer. We're so impressed by your loss of knowledge. Nobody can like, and we've all been guilty of saying that. And that's just your ego getting in the way and not appreciating the people that you have that have been gifted to you. Your job as a leader is to lead. And your team, they are a gift, not a burden. It's a gift because I promise you when you're undermanned and you don't have enough people, you're going to wish that you had more people and that culture comes from you. So that's all I have, Danny. Yeah. And that's, that's a, a great point. And we'll tie this all in of how we kind of get to recognizing those towards the end of this, but yeah, changing that mindset and mentality of going from, cause we're going to talk about some challenges, but I, I, I would I would challenge you to try to always keep your mindset in that these people are a benefit. The fact that they're different than me, that's a benefit because I have a lot of flaws. And if you can check your ego in that, which we're going to talk about, and always see them as a benefit. Now let's step into some of these challenges that we have to acknowledge, okay? Because there are challenges here. So these are the challenges of dealing with and leading people that are not like you. Look, we have a mindset called innovate and adapt. And for those of you that are familiar with it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But the reality is, is this is one of those situations where you're forced to have to be able to innovate and adapt when you're dealing with different personalities, different strengths, different weaknesses, and different things amongst your team. Now, remember, they are a benefit, but there is work involved here, and you have to be intentional about it because you have to be able to know what team member needs what, when, and how. Now, I have an example of that, that certain tools are for specific jobs, right? Just because you know something to be successful one way doesn't mean it's always going to work. If I'm on a construction job and I'm using a hammer for 60% of this job, I can't just be like, well, this hammer works for most things and take that hammer over to something that needs to be screwed or drilled or something like that and just start beating it with a hammer. It's not going to be effective. And you have to know when one method's not going to be effective in one shape or form for one person or the next. And what I mean by that is we have a tendency to do what? Well, I know this works. This has worked with five of my 10 people. This hammer has worked 60% of the time. So instead of innovating and adapting and changing, what do we do? We put more time, more effort, more pressure, more pain, more all of this into that same method. And you have to stop yourself from trying to do that because it's not going to work. You have to innovate and adapt and know these people. Now, a good example of that. Years ago, well, a little over a decade total, I used to run and teach paramedic programs, EMT programs, advanced cardiology classes, so on and so forth. And I would have about classes full of 30 to 35 students all the time of EMTs, paramedics. And that was a really big challenging point for me because I started to learn that like everybody learns a different way. I can't teach one thing a different way. I had to be able to innovate and adapt. I had to come up with different analogies. I had to come up with different methods. And I had to realize that certain people learn certain ways. I needed to know that, hey, this person, they need audible learning. This person needs a visual aid. This person needs tactile function. This person needs all three of those things. And when I started to realize that, I don't mean this in a, in a rude way, but I would pick a student or a group of students and I would call them the golden standard, not out loud. 
in my mind. But I knew it was because I'm starting to get to know these students and I know that this student needs these types of methods and this student picks it up immediately. And I would go through all these methods of teaching and when that student's eyes lit up or when that group of students eyes lit up and I knew the light bulb turned on, I knew that everybody else in the room now had it because I had gone through this whole mechanism and method I had of, I'm going to walk through all these analogies. I'm going to walk through all these abilities and I'm going to teach it in all these different ways to make sure that everybody in this room is understanding. Now, something that will definitely help you with that is our second law of combat, right? Even though each one of these people are going to learn differently, even though each one of them receives information differently, if you keep things simple and you're operating on a simple, clear, and concise format, that's going to be the thing that's going to help you um, more easily navigate across those gaps of information and across those gaps of ability to intake information, all right? Um, yeah, so don't put more effort into ineffective methods. Okay. There's nothing more frustrating. And this is sometimes a point of contention. Like my wife will come to me and say something and I'll tell her like, I can't relate to anything you're saying right now. I don't understand anything you're saying. And then what does she do sometimes? She repeats the exact same thing to me. And I'm like, you realize that if I tell you, I don't understand something, I don't know what you're talking about. And you repeat the exact same thing to me that didn't make me understand it any more than the first time I didn't understand it. Right. That's partially because I'm dumb, right? So most of the time, like I said, she's much smarter than me, <clears throat> but it's like, she has to figure out a different way. Okay, like this doesn't make sense this manner. I got to find a different way to explain these things. The ability to innovate and adapt and the ability to keep things simple, clear, and concise. This is imperative with being able to lead team members that are not like you. Because again, your perspective is one. Your perspective is single-sided and you need to get those other perspectives, which means you need to be able to teach in other ways, shapes, and forms. Now, the second point to this on these challenges I want to talk about, this is something we talk about a lot at Echelon Front, is you're going to have to navigate some egos, okay? The first ego you're going to have to navigate is your own, because what did I say earlier? Experience leads to conclusions. So what do we tend to always think? My experience led me to this conclusion. I know that experience to be fact, right? Because that happened, I experienced it in my life. And what we tend to do is, if I know this experience to be fact, then I know that to be correct. That's not true, right? So you have to navigate your own ego. When we talk about different perspectives, you should always be searching for a reason that you're wrong. And we talk about this quite a bit at Echelon Front. Your default approach should be, how am I wrong? How are they right? How can I support what they are saying and bring to the table? You have to navigate your own ego. And the second ego, sets of egos you're going to have to navigate is your team's egos. Because along with those perspectives, along with the myriad of experience, and along with all of the great talents and abilities that your team's going to have, it's going to come along with some egos, okay? There's no way around that. But you have to be able to navigate those egos. The first way to navigate their egos is to check your own. Because understand that if they're having an ego and something they're saying is bothering you, that's not their ego, it's yours. Okay, so we have to acknowledge that first and foremost. But the other thing is, you have to recognize talent. Sometimes you may have that ego that they're coming with, but get past the ego, get past what bothers you and really see where is it coming from. Maybe they do have a ton of experience. They may be approaching it wrong, but that doesn't mean that they're not someone who is correct and needs to be handling that problem for you. All right, so we got to navigate those egos. And the last thing I want to talk about about the challenges is we've talked about recognizing perspectives. We've talked about recognizing talents, having them as an arrow in your quiver and really utilize them. Broadening your ability for decentralized command, which is this is what we're talking about. Decentralized command is our primary goal here, right? But there's a line between utilizing there's a line between recognizing and then there's a line between abusing your team, okay? I've worked with some fantastic leaders that would tell you that are great at decentralized command and they're great at giving out ownership and they're great at pulling back when they need and they're great at giving you freedom. And then I've worked with some leaders that recognize talents and then dump the entire workload on them and it's not because they want to decentralize, it's because they just don't want to do the work right? 
you have to understand, and we say this at Echelon Front a lot, man, your intent has a stench. It has a smell. And people are going to figure that out so quickly. And I won't use names, titles, or even states. Uh, I've worked in three different states, and um, I've made that mistake, as I've said on these before. I worked with a leader at one point who would recognize talents and then just completely offload everything he's responsible for. Oh, hey, you're really good at writing reports. You get to write mine now. Um, we're like, oh, that seems like a bad deal, right? No, no, man, I'm trying to build you. I'm trying to build you as a leader, as a team. I see PJ laughing, right? It's like, yeah, um, I don't know, man. Me doing your personal reports doesn't really seem like that's helping anybody other than you. Because guess what? I have my own workload. And there's things I want to take ownership. I want to do stuff. But there is a line between recognizing utilization and abusing your team members. And that's a challenge. And only you're going to know if you're crossing that line. And if you're starting to get pushback, and if you're starting to have people that are not wanting ownership and not want to do things for you, you need to ask yourself, am I abusing their talents and abilities or am I utilizing their talents and abilities? Because there is a fine line. Boss, what do you got? Nothing to add, man. I mean, that was all great information. Um, you know, I like how you reiterate at the end, like this, what we're talking about is a decentralized command, you know, and culture is the ultimate form of decentralized command. And so uh, we can, we can quickly look at our organization and we at Echelon Front can quickly go in to organizations and assess how well decentralized command is being used based off the culture and just a quick hey you know if they have a good culture they're most likely using decentralized command pretty dang good and it allows us to understand like okay hey here's the root problem you know and just as long as we're being mindful of looking at our team and the organization that we're a part of and being honest with ourselves in regards to the culture and not saying like oh yeah my guys love it here do they? And, you know, that's something as a leader, you need to, you know, also understand that when you're trying to gauge your team, your perspective is flawed, like Danny was talking about earlier. And so what you need to do is have really good relationships and you need to be out there working with your men and women, listening to them and understanding what's their actual pain points and what are they talking about? And then that can, then that allows you to allows you to do an assessment of the organization and you know then it goes and the more time you're spending with your team then the more times you're doing these things that Danny was talking about that we need to be doing is building relationships with all the different individuals and person personnel and you know and and just be mindful that we're not making the mistake that every single human makes it's we like to spend time with the people that we like if they're on your team, you need to be equally spending time with all your different team members. And you guys are all smiling because we've all been guilty of that. Because you know, you have your people on your team that you're like, man, you know what? I really like PJ. And so when it's time to go spend time with your guys, you're like, well, I'm spending time with my team. And then if you're being honest, you're like, well, I mean, I spend most of my time with PJ. And once in a while, I'll go talk with, you know, uh, Mike and all these different guys and Brian is just like, well, you know, are we, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing as a leader? And as a leader, we need to be detaching from our emotions and understanding that our job is to lead all of our team um, uh, properly and give them the resources for growth. 